tough times are going to, are going to happen, but when you are doing things right in your business and you're putting away money and you're, and you, you don't cower, a lot of people cowered, they pulled back, not me. We went all in. It was scary as all get out but we went all in and expanded. That was dangerous. That was risky. Most people won't take that kind of risk in business. So that was one thing that I want to talk about is you said, this is the time to invest. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing in business. This is the time to go all in. People yep. are going to pull back on those Facebook ads, go mm -hmm. all in. People aren't going to write those books because they don't have the money. You go all in. People aren't going to put in the time and the effort and the investment to get ahead of the game, you do it because it will pay off in dividends. Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candice Riotti. Today I'm joined by strategic business consultant, Ann Carden. Ann, you've built seven successful businesses and sold five of them. We need to hear the story. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> <laughs> So, All of the above. Yes, yes I have. I, I've been an entrepreneur for going on 34 years, I guess, 35 years. So many, many years I left my corporate career, my corporate income to be a stay-at-home mom. And we started struggling financially, only having one income. And it didn't matter how I squeezed my husband's paycheck. It was not enough. And we found ourselves kind of in financial hardship. So I started looking for a way to make money. And that was where my very first business started. Um, started with kind of what I saw was popular out there and what I thought I could do. And I started a doll business. It didn't actually start out as a doll business, but it turned into a global doll business. And that was before the internet. So that was 30, yeah, 35 years ago. And it was shipping all over the world. I had a lot of moms working for me. I was basically running a manufacturing company out of my home. And I built that internationally by running in international magazines, running ads in international magazines. And then I was in multiple stores across the country with my dolls. So did that for, did my own designs. Um, so they were somewhat designer and did that for seven years and then started my next business and my next business and my next. And now we're on number six. I own two now, six and seven, but they're intertwined. So even though they're two, businesses, they work together. Yeah, well, that just makes total sense. Two different things, but they work together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, your first business was a doll business. Mm -hmm. you, you employed moms mm -hmm. and this was before the internet. Mm -hmm. You advertised in magazines mm -hmm. and stores. I was in stores too, but mm -hmm. is that business still around? No, no. I actually, I sold it when, so the market started changing. I was in it about seven years and the market started shifting. So it was really, uh, it was a craft business, right? You know, fell into the craft business. And that was, again, many years ago, it was kind of exploding across the country. And I thought, well, I can make some things. And so that's how it started, which the first things I made didn't sell. FYI, I had to do some market research and then create my own version of it. But, um, you know, that I did that for seven years, but then at the very, maybe the last couple of years, we saw the market changing and it, people were starting to buy from China and they were, everything was being imported. And we, I couldn't even buy the supplies as cheap as you could buy the finished products from China and imported. And so I started shifting to designing patterns where people could create my designs on their own. They could, you know, make them themselves. And so I had a, another revenue stream for a long time that was patterns and then uh, advertised in pattern magazines and, and all of that. And then when I ended up selling, I, I just got tired of it. The pattern part wasn't the part I loved. I did like doing the design, but doing all the pattern stuff. I just didn't enjoy that piece of it. So I, I knew it was time to make a shift. And so I sold my designs and sold the, sold that to a pattern company. Um, and then started, I didn't even know what my next thing was going to be. Um, uh, kind of a funny story, how I got into that too, but my next business was a fitness business, but that started. That's a, because, that's a pivot. That's a huge, pivot. Uh, it was, a, it's definitely a pivot. Yeah. So I, so I had gained 50 pounds. I'd always, I had never had a weight problem in my life. 
And I was always very active. I was in sports. I was a cheerleader, all those things. But I had gained 50 pounds with that business. It was very sedentary. And I didn't know what I was going to do, what my next thing was. By this point, my kids were in school. I was a room mom. And, you know, I got to do all the things with them. But I knew there had to be something else for me, but I didn't know what that was. And so I really struggled, even mentally, I kind of struggled with, okay, what now? It's almost like my identity was gone in a way because I had done that for so many years. And going back into corporate, I had been um, in retail management and I managed multi-million dollar departments in really high-end department stores. And when I gave that up, that wasn't really an option to go back into because we live out in the country, out of the city. And so there would have been that whole thing. And I didn't want those kinds of hours again. And after working for yourself at home, it's kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? But there wasn't a lot of opportunity. So I thought, well, the only thing I know I can do is take care of myself. So I started eating right and exercising. And I absolutely fell in love with the shape I got in. And I started looking around and I thought, I want to help other people. That that was really... I I didn't really go into it thinking, oh, I want to make a bunch of money doing this. It wasn't like that. It was like, maybe I can make some money, but more than anything, I want to help other people. I want to help other moms feel as good as I do. And uh, two health clubs and two weight loss centers later (laughs) that I sold, um, that, yeah, that was my next 20 years. So I just kind of kept building. Wanting other people to feel good is a noble cause. God's really used me in that way with everything I've ever done. It's always been, there's always been wanting to make a difference for other people. Uh, Obviously I'm in business and I teach people how to make money. And that's a huge piece of it. If you're going to be around, you have to make money. And I do think that's an important piece that a lot of people tend to leave out, but to have that with passion, with a, a care to want to make a difference in other people's lives. To me, there's just no better way to build a business. So listening to you talk, there are a lot of parallels in our story. Not only do we have great fashion sense, because, you know, we're (laughs) matchy-matchy today, (laughs) but I also had a career in retail where I managed millions of dollars of inventory for, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for wholesale manufacturing, and then I went in as a buyer. Um, And Mm -hmm. then my husband and I started a business where we uh, handcrafted custom furniture business. And a lot of the people that were in the, in my network were crafters because be, because we made reproduction furniture, you know, primitive furniture, I guess is mm-hmm. what they would call it. And then guess what happened? China started making primitive furniture. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, that back then, though, those were kind of the times. It's kind of like entrepreneurs now are online and they're building businesses online. That was the opportunity. That was an opportunity back then. Those were the opportunities that we had to, mm-hmm. as entrepreneurs. So. Well, we it doesn't surprise me. We started right when the internet was a, was a thing. We were the first mm-hmm. custom furniture business to have a website. Mm-hmm. And then everybody who came after us basically copied our website. Mm-hmm. I mean, that literally. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there was one situation where I came across a about us page. Mm-hmm. Word was, for word, verbatim. Word for word. Our that about used to us be story. a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Really? You didn't. And then they blamed it on their web designer when I called them out. I'm like, eh, yeah, <laughs> that was really common. I worked with so many businesses where that was a problem that, you know, people copying their websites because nobody knew how to do websites. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so they would just copy everybody else. But now it's AI. Now they're having AI write out all their copy. Yeah. And I actually, I use AI a lot and I, You know, sometimes I have AI help me write email letters and stuff. And Mm -hmm. one of my friends calls me out and says, you used AI to write this. And I was like, I thought I edited it enough that you wouldn't be able to tell. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know know what? I don't think there's anything wrong with it, though. I I do think you have to still put your voice to it. What I like to do is write my thing first and then I'll, you know, do use AI to kind of just spice it up a little bit. Um, oh, so that's, that's the opposite how, of what most it's people the do. the opposite. Yeah. I, it is the opposite. Now I've done it both ways. Sometimes if I'm just trying to jog my brain or something, I'll have, uh, you know, AI write something and then I'll go in and edit. But I like to do it in reverse where I get my thoughts and everything down and it's my voice. And then I just have it, you know, chat GPT, jazz it up. 
I had a copywriter teach me, and I'm probably giving away her secrets, and I apologize if I'm giving away your secrets, Miss Copywriter. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows. <laughs> but she taught me to just tell it, to tell it, to ask me questions. Like, I want you to help me do this, so mm -hmm. ask me a question. And then it would ask me questions, I'd answer the questions, and that it's a very long, arduous process. I mean, it, the, the process mm -hmm. of getting something written takes a long time because yeah. we're having a conversation with ChatGPT, but... Mm -hmm it sort of drills down, you know, and it's okay to tell chat GPT, hey, that's not exactly what I wanted at all. Mm -hmm. You know, give me something else. So anyway, yeah. how do we get there's down? a lot of ways to use it? Mm -hmm. There are and it changes every every time I log into chat GPT, something different. Mm -hmm. so. I love it. I mean, it, it just is getting, you know, it's getting better and better. And people are so afraid of being replaced. And sure, I think there's going to be some of that. But you know, with it, I always say with every change, there's more opportunity and people need to realize that. Look, I, I, I'm getting old and I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of things that have happened. I mean, retail has basically gone away stores and, you know, now everything's e-commerce and online and Amazon. And so it just opens opportunities up for innovators and people to do other things. And so I don't think we need to be afraid of it. There are already so many people that are capitalizing on AI with new systems and teaching people AI. And I mean, it just, you know, that's just the way the world works. You said a magic number. You said you, after seven years, you, you're, um, you realized your doll business that needed to change. Mm -hmm. um, seven seems to be a magic number in business. Like every seven years, it's a, <laughs> there's a cycle and you have to constantly be adapting and pivoting. If you, mm -hmm. if you don't you want to talk about what happens if you don't. 100%. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you just become irrelevant. And one of the things I think this is so important for any entrepreneur, and I have lived this in every one of my businesses. I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to be now, was I always the best? Not saying that, but I always strove, I always was striving to be the best. And I was always striving to stay cutting edge. What's new? What can I do that other people aren't doing yet? What, how can I be the first? How can I be the trailblazer? And I have lived that in my businesses. And, and I have this philosophy. I want my competition chasing me. I don't want to be chasing my competition. And I still live that in my business today. What can I do that is above what other people are out there doing? That's not the norm. How can I stand out? I really think that's a great philosophy in business because it keeps you very relevant in the market. It really does keep you looking like you're doing bigger, doing bigger things. Do you think that there is a, a balance? Well, of course there's a balance between being the innovator and bringing something to market before the market's ready for it. Do you understand the question? Did I ask yes. that right? No, I completely understand the question. Yes, it can be hard. For example, when I first became a business coach 15 years ago, you know, they weren't a dime a dozen. Right. And so, and I didn't know what I know now about the marketing side of it, but I would go to networking events and I would say, I'm a business coach. I help people grow their business. And most people did not know what a business coach was, and they didn't really know what it meant for a business coach to help them grow their business. And so it was a little harder sell just because people weren't familiar with it, but also the one thing that it does though, is it, it actually puts you on a course to go faster and to be a, ahead of everybody else. Because then by the time a lot of people were coming into business coaching, I, I became part of an organization and people were coming in. I was way ahead of them. And it was kind of like they had to catch up and I had already built a lot of experience and already, you know, had things going and thriving. And so I, I think, yes, there to a degree, it's a little harder to be a trailblazer because people aren't familiar, but I don't think that's a reason to not do it. Oh, I agree. You, there's always, always, there's always somebody who has to be first, but it's the thing about having a coach or a consultant in your corner is that you have a cheerleader, but you also have somebody to say that's bullshit. Yeah. Right. That's not going to work. <laughs> or you're going to you're going to lose a lot of money doing that. <laughs> you know, or <laughs> yes. if you really want to do that, let's figure out how to do it so you don't lose a lot of money when you're exactly. doing that. You exactly. You know, um and a coach has to feel comfortable saying those things. Mm -hmm. And the person who hires a coach has to feel comfortable allowing the coach to say those things. 
Yeah. I mean, I look at, you know, I'm very careful about the people that I bring in. I, I am a say it like it is. Look, I have, I've run the gamut. I've been through recession, nine to nine 11, I, Y2K, um, high, you know, competitors trying to run me out of business. I put competitors out of business. I've been through so many things over 35 years. I have such deep experience and knowledge and, and wisdom really, and skills. Um, and so I feel like if you're hiring me, you're hiring me before that you are hiring my expertise. So if you're not going to, um, if you're still going to do things the way you think they need to be done, because that's what you think when somebody can look and say, okay, maybe that's not going to work or that's not going to work this way, or here's why, you know, I, why hire somebody if you're not going to take their advice or, or, you know, really embrace that. Um, I'm somebody, I'm always a learner and I've always worked with coaches and I don't hire coaches if I'm not willing to listen to them. And, and I'm more of a consultant in the fact that most people, a lot of people don't know how to build a business. They don't know the strategies. They don't know the ins and outs. It's not like a life coach where you pull the knowledge, you know, where you pull their, their information out of them. People, we're talking about skill sets here and strategy and people don't instinctively always know those things, right? You have to learn that stuff. So it's not the same. And so I do more consulting, advising, showing, teaching, how, holding them accountable. It's all of those pieces. But yeah, if somebody doesn't think, want that, they shouldn't invest in a coach or a consultant. I think a consultant is more um, important than a coach. A coach is going to rah, rah, rah and cheer you on. A consultant is going to be like, yeah. 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 I and, do that. You know, I, I dance when my clients have, re- you know, get like, great results but, and I'm super, super but that's excited, just, but you know, that's, that, that's the bonus, right? That's, that's yeah. the, the good stuff. The bonus. You know what? You can get in Facebook groups and have rah, rah. You don't have to pay somebody for that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So this is the middle, the, we're, tw- we're recording this towards the end of July, just a few days after the crowd strike debacle. <laughs> and you mentioned Y2K and, and all, and all the, oh, the gosh. you know, and everything. Then so, it. so I want to talk about what a small business can learn from what just happened with CrowdStrike. And if mm-hmm. you don't know what I'm talking about, they mm-hmm. uploaded a patch and there was a single line in the patch that was corrupt and mm-hmm. it took out Microsoft computers in businesses around the globe. And, they, and, and then the, the CEO took culpability and said, my bad, we are bad and fixed it. Right. So what can small businesses learn from this? Yeah. Well, first of all, I do not think we should only know how to build our business online. (laughs) Gee, (laughs) (laughs) there's something that, you know, you don't hear often in 2024. Uh, No, I, and trust me, I, almost everything I do is online. However, however, I have built all my other businesses offline through networking, through speaking, through offline strategies, offline advertising, right? The the old, you know, direct mail was a thing, advertising in magazines. And th- so here, here's my point. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, in any one basket. I think that's a really dangerous thing to do. And I see entrepreneurs, you know, you should have multiple income streams, but they should be connected and related. Don't try to, you know, have 15 different kinds of businesses. That's never, that's a lack of focus. That's not going to work. But I think you shouldn't put all your eggs in any one basket. So I would say that's what we need to learn. That's a, that's really trusting, you know, we granted, I mean, we're already out there with bank accounts and things like that, right? We're, we are trusting. So, but you know what, bury cash in your backyard. (laughs) Don't be without cash. I mean, these are things that people don't think about, but they're very real things. Yeah. I was at a pizza parlor picking up a pizza not something I normally do. You I get have, it free. No, no. I had, a, I was thinking of a pizza because I had a friend in town. I, I live in Michigan. So Detroit style pizza is something that a lot of folks outside of Michigan might not understand. The friend coming in, she had two boys. I thought it'd be fun for them to try Detroit style pizza because it is different. It's not like any other pizza. And so I was standing in line at the Detroit style pizza place. And the guy in front of me was trying to pay for his order with cash, cash, $20 bills. And they wouldn't accept the cash. 
It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But that is the world we are going to. Yeah, I think some things are scary. I I think that's scarier than AI, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of people are freaking out about AI and, and especially tech people that, you know, a lot of them are losing their jobs and things like that. Um, but, you know, you have to protect yourself in a lot of ways. And it's just good sense. It's good common sense. And maybe this just comes from my age. Actually, I have a birthday in a couple of days. So oh, happy I birthday. I'm really, that age thing's really starting to, <laughs> to sound relevant. But um, you really do have to try to protect yourself in multiple ways. So multiple income streams, multiple, you know, keep cash, invest, it, it just there are so many things that you can do to, to try to, we can't, we can't do all of it. Right. But yeah, um, we can't guarantee it is what I'm trying to say. And don't freak out. I, yeah. I noticed well, that doesn't, that's not going to help. So. I noticed in, again, we're recording this at the end of July, 2024. And I noticed this morning that the S and P had dropped a little bit, but the news, the, the news says falling fast. Well, in the presidential cycle, the third quarter of the final year of the presidential cycle, the S&P always falls. Always. It doesn't matter who the president is or who the incoming president is going to be or whatever. It always falls the third cycle of the final year of the presidential, you know, the four-year presidential term. And um, that goes back to the seven-year thing. So, you know, people are freaking out. But I'm thinking, hmm, now's a really good time to invest. <laughs> you know? That's right. Because no, it's, that's it's going to come back. Right. It's it going to come back. Yeah, it's the it is the time. Uh, you know, that kind of brings up a, an interesting story. Do you want me to share this? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so so when the 2008 recession came around, I had a health club. And I also kind of right before the recession hit, or I, it, we were already on the, it was already hitting. Things were already, uh, yeah, businesses were already struggling. There was a competitor that came in to my market. Now I'm in a town of about 15,000 people, not a lot of people to draw oh, from, right? That's a very small town, yeah. Yes, very small town. And so this competitor comes in and they literally knock off my whole club. And, and they even add, so somebody had deep pockets and they wanted their kids to run a fitness center. So they built this gym, beautiful gym, basically all new equipment. And it was, uh, you know, it was a, like my prices were like $49. Theirs was 19 and 10. Mm. Okay. So I'm doing the math because I know the market and I'm saying, how are they do like, there's no way this can support you know, what the money that they're putting out, what long story short. So anyways, but because I had built a really good business and I had always built, believed in a premium model, more premium. I also had other, we had a $12,000 membership. Now this was 20 something years ago and we sold them. I had the doctors, the lawyers, the people that had a lot of money in my club. And so I, I was doing very, very well, but this low price competitor came in. Well, of course the recession's hitting. And so you always have those people that, you know, is it really a priority for them to spend $49 a month to be in a health club or whatever? So they were the people that jumped, right? They were the people that wanted to try the new place. And you always have those people. So we took a hit. And so I started immediately looking for ways to set myself apart from them because what had they done? They had completely knocked off my business. And so I put in a weight loss center. They did not offer that. And the weight loss center made four times what my health club did in fees. So wow. we were getting paid four times the amount of money per client. So that was one way I set it apart. But the other thing I did is I expanded and opened two more in another location. I opened another, I opened a high-end boot camp for women and I open facility. And then I opened another weight loss center that went along with that too. And again, played in the premium market because they're not affected the same way people that are trying to figure out how to pay their electric bill are affected. Right. So I, I knew that from building businesses that the premium market was always going to be recession proof. So I opened two more. We put everything on the line to expand and to open those other two clubs and people all around me were shutting down, all around me were shutting down. In fact, one of the gyms that was in our town came and asked me to buy them out. 
Wow. And I looked at what they had and I said, I don't need equipment. There's really nothing for me to buy. I had the number one club anyway, even, even with that other club, I still, you know, I really built a reputation. I had programs they didn't have that kind of thing. And so I knew that if I could make it through the recession with these four businesses, that I would really be, you know, ahead of the, ahead of the curve. So this other club asked me to buy them out. I wouldn't buy them out. And long story short, I was able to sell all four of those businesses later and wow. walk away very, it was really a good deal. So um, the reason I'm telling you that is two things. Tough times are going to, are going to happen, but when you um, are doing things right in your business and you're putting away money and you're, and you, you don't cower. A lot of people cowered. They pulled back. Not me. We went all in. It was scary as all get out, but we went all in and expanded. That was dangerous. That was risky. Most people won't take that kind of risk in business. So that was one thing that I want to talk about is you said, this is the time to invest. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing in business. This is the time to go all in. People yep. are going to pull back on those Facebook ads. Go mm -hmm. all in. People aren't going to write those books because they don't have the money. You go all in. People aren't going to put in the time and the effort and the investment to get ahead of the game. You do it because it will pay off in dividends. So in 2007, we were selling, my husband and I had a furniture business and we were selling to retail stores around the country and we could feel the economy mm -hmm. squeezing. And then we were in a forced into a position where we had to fire our top client, like our number one client, we had to fire them. Mm. 2008 was a year of changing, switching, adapting. We did made a lot of changes in 2008. One of them was what we no longer sold wholesale. We changed to our target demographic was we tripled our prices because we weren't mm -hmm. selling wholesale anymore. We oh, could, same you, kind of philosophy. Yeah. And yeah. Um, 2009 was our best year in terms of profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you go high end, which is the model that I teach people, Go I help people pre play at a really premium end of the market. Um, so I have a client that closed a $400,000 sale. Um, and so the, the playing at those really high numbers, when you do that, you are not in the same category and exactly. the recession and the problems and the, you, you literally are creating your own economy because typically it's not always the case, but typically people that have money will always have money mm -hmm. because they know how to multiply their money. Mm -hmm. And so when you're going after that premium client, that luxury market, it doesn't mean that's all you have to do. But when that is your main business, like that's what saved all my businesses is we were going after the people that had lucrative incomes and we were business owners and, you know, in businesses like insurance and attorneys, people that weren't going to go away. Um, and so I just believe in that model, but, but you want to hear uh, something funny kind of uh, on, on the back end of that story. Years later, I had already sold the clubs. I'm already coaching the club that tried to put me out of business called me the the owner called me and she said was well, she actually she was more the investor of the kids that and she said would you like to come buy our club and i said uh, i don't really want to get back into the fitness business but you know what i i invest in businesses so i'll i'll come take a look and they opened up their books and what i found is it was never profitable Ever, she told me it's never it's always lost money and here was the thing they were using it as a tax shelter so when all my instincts and everything were right mm -hmm. but the story behind this is when people have deep pockets they can play the game a lot longer yeah. and they can put other people out of business and um and so you have to get your you have to think that way in business and you have to work to get yourself to that place well you also have to balance being a decent human with absolutely you know <laughs> yeah I, yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying, yeah, don't, money not saying at all don't be a decent human no, I, no, I, i'm not saying be a slime ball no. yeah <laughs> i want to i want to uh go back with her a little bit because you said that you added weight loss to your gym mm -hmm. and i want to share a strategic partnership that is it, right in that genre so the gym that my husband and i used to go to when we before we moved we moved to michigan about eight years ago before we moved to michigan we went to this gym and 
the Weight Watchers Corporation started meeting at the gym in one of their mm-hmm. meeting spaces. And all of a sudden, the gym had more clients, mm-hmm. you know, and Weight Watchers yep. had more clients mm-hmm. because they saw each other there. It was so strategic. Want to talk about strategic partnerships. Yeah, I, I, I love strategic partnerships. It's really funny. I'm writing an article right now for LinkedIn. It might be part of my next magazine too, um, about all the income streams, multiple income streams. And when I break down all the income streams and revenue streams that I have in my business, and I, I told you they're all intertwined. They, in fact, a lot of people don't even know I offer those things because they're done internally uh, with clients. So, oh, you need this? Okay, here, you know, we provide this. But I love to have partnerships where it's basically passive income for me and, or it feeds my business. And so it's so powerful. There's so many ways to do partnerships. You can do it where, you know, you do referrals, you can do it where you team up. Let's say I want to run a workshop and you've got my ideal people. Uh, Candace, I would love for you to help me fill my workshop. I'll give you a piece on the back end for whatever sells. There's so many ways to leverage this. And I have to tell you, when we do this, it is just it's a game changer in our business. It cuts back on your advertising cost. It's more profitable. Even though you're giving away a piece, you're not giving away something unless it's a sure thing. So let's say I sell a package for, you know, 10 grand or 25 grand and Candace gets 10%. Well, I'm not giving Candace 10% unless that sells. So it's a sure thing versus Mm -hmm. A lot of times marketing is, you know, it's money that you're putting out there and it's a risk, right? You, if you get good at it, you can learn to multiply, but it still takes some time to do that. So I have partnerships for multiple things. We write books for people. We launch podcasts for people. I mean, just so many things that I do partnerships for. It's smart. It's super smart. All right. So we've talked about a lot of things, but is there anything that you want to talk about we haven't talked about yet? No, you know, the only thing I would say is, you know, we were talking about don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I think a really important thing for people to do, besides always look for ways to stand out, be above, rise to the top, always look for ways to do that. But one thing that I would like to say is really take advantage of what we do have right now on the internet, because you can be everywhere. Um, I got, I see too many people that are uh, it, gosh, they're, they're doing dangerous things. Like they're building their whole business on Facebook. That's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, so or I was shut down. Or, or yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was shut down on Facebook right before the pandemic and I took a hit and I didn't enjoy it. And it was a big pain in the butt. Did they tell you why? No, uh, no. And it was right before COVID. So I never got my accounts back. I never, I had to completely start over everything I had spent time investing in. However, I wasn't only on Facebook. I also, I'm a big uh, fan of LinkedIn. I teach people how to build on LinkedIn. I had a YouTube channel. I had an email list. I had, I knew how to network. I knew how to get out and go speak and do all those things. And so to my point, don't, Again, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but take advantage of what we've got out there, but go bigger. Don't think small and put yourself in a box, but just really level up everything you're doing and take advantage of these tools. I mean, most of them are free. Mm -hmm. And so to not be leveraging the internet the way you could be is just craziness to me. And we've never had this kind of opportunity. Well, and you also have to know where your market is though. I mean, if you're marketing to people my age, it needs to be on Facebook or LinkedIn, not necessarily. True, Instagram, but it doesn't only have to be there. And that's, yeah. that's but, what I'm trying but to But knowing say. where, knowing where they hang out. Yeah. And but build an email list or a community off of that platform or do something to get people off of that platform. So you're not only on there is really what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And the other thing is you can build strategic alliances and partnerships everywhere. So don't, when people kind of, again, put themselves in that box, they're missing all this other opportunity that they're not even seeing or don't even know exist. Um, people are Googling people now. So if they're looking for something, they're going to Google. If you don't have a very powerful, robust uh you know, footprint online, you don't have your own website, you don't have, you don't have other assets. Again, you're, you're really putting your business at risk. So st- start thinking that way, 
because these are assets to your business. Mm -hmm. And understand the ones that are evergreen. So if you are putting out video content and you're not also putting it on YouTube, you really need to consider doing YouTube. Yeah, because, repurpose. Because repurpose. You, YouTube mm -hmm. is evergreen. Mm -hmm. Some of the other channels are not. Some of the channels you put something out and you don't see it the next day. Uh, I put a video right. out. I put about video out yesterday on Facebook, and I also put it on YouTube. It has absolutely zero traction on YouTube as of today. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, it was, you know, I had to turn turn my phone off and not stop looking because it just kept getting a whole bunch of mm -hmm. activity. But I have a feeling that in a week or two, it's going to get some traction on YouTube. It just hasn't mm -hmm. happened yet, right? Mm -hmm. But it'll never be seen again on Facebook. Right. It goes away. That's one thing I love about uh, LinkedIn, actually, if if you are not on LinkedIn. And I mean, almost everybody in business now is on has a LinkedIn profile. But if you're not on LinkedIn, first of all, it's a search engine. Second, it's going to come up on Google. Even if you're not going to play there, you need to be on there with a very strong, powerful profile. But the other thing I love about it, it's kind of like a mini website. You get to put all of your experience. You get feature, you have featured section. You can create a newsletter. Uh, you can highlight things on LinkedIn that stay on LinkedIn. And, and there's it is really, a it's a very innovative platform. It does it things really that none is. of the other platforms does, and it does all the other it does all the things every other platform. All does everything, too. yes, yeah. yeah. And and again, it comes up on Google. And it's more robust. And do you know that, uh, because I teach people LinkedIn, 90% of people said that they would trust a brand more on LinkedIn than Facebook or TikTok. Well, or, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about that, it builds trust. There's also trust in the market. And uh, isn't, so isn't it the, the statistic, I, you, you'll know it better than I do, but isn't the statistic like only 10% of LinkedIn users actually post? Yeah, it's very low. I know only about 6% do video, which is crazy. It's just crazy to me. Oh, I should put that um, video on LinkedIn then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it yeah. Does. No, you should. Yeah, you should. Um, yeah, I think it's something like 6% only do video. And yes, you know, it, it's getting better now. It may be higher. I haven't researched it for a while. But it's not, the platform is not utilized like it could be, which is great because you can be the trailblazer oh, on LinkedIn. Yeah. I mean, I've like, I don't know, almost 25,000 connections or something on LinkedIn. And it, it just, to me, it's it's just a, an asset to your business that. Well, it, and if you don't know what doing. to do on LinkedIn now, go to your, follow you, follow, follow Ann. Yeah. Follow Ann. Yeah. yeah. And you'll figure out what to do. Yeah, do you want to talk about how to generate le leads on LinkedIn? Uh, if we have time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've got a little bit of time. Okay. I mean, the main thing, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but the thing that you have to realize is LinkedIn has live streaming. Now it's, you have to have a third party platform to stream on LinkedIn, but you can live stream on LinkedIn. You can do audio events on LinkedIn. You can have a newsletter on LinkedIn. One of the best ways to generate leads on LinkedIn is first set up your profile, optimize it, Make sure keyword, it's keyword rich. Make sure you're very targeted on who you're trying to attract, what, what your value proposition statement is. All of your profiles should be really optimized for who you're going after. But then create an, and then start connecting with the people that you want. Build your network with the right people, just like you would on really, we can't really do that on YouTube, but Facebook you can, right? So build your network with the right people. But one of the fastest ways to get traction is to create a newsletter specific to who you are trying to target. And now on, on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, they have a newsletter feature and LinkedIn loves their newsletters and they will push those babies out to, okay, here's an example. I created a brand new newsletter two weeks ago. I have, I don't know, 1400 subscribers already, something like that. Um, usually when I have my clients create a newsletter within a couple of days, they'll have, you know, two or 300, 400 subscribers. What's, what is different about the newsletter and LinkedIn than the newsletter? Well, LinkedIn you're... loves newsletters. But, so but, they... but are you giving, are you sharing the same content with the LinkedIn newsletter as you would with your MailChimp newsletter or are they different things? It's a little bit. I mean, I repurpose content, so it might have I go a little deeper on my LinkedIn newsletters than I would like in an email because then, but I would use an email to drive people to the newsletter. So can I get some free um, consulting? <laughs> <laughs> what would, do you need? Would, would, would you suggest that I create a newsletter for the podcast? And when I have a podcast release, I release it as a newsletter. Um, no, no, I okay. don't. 
no, but what you could do is create a newsletter around podcasting and create a podcast newsletter and then always pitch your podcast in the newsletter with some content. That's the way I would. Okay. So continue to do what I do when I release a new podcast episode is I share a little video and you yeah. Know, a little yeah, but uh, you do a LinkedIn newsletter it, around podcasting or whatever, and you continue to build your expertise in that newsletter, you'll get a following of people interested in podcasting and, you know, whatever you do. And that's how you'll start building a lot of traction that way. I mean, people are shocked at the traction they can get from a LinkedIn newsletter. That's really interesting. It, and the reason for that is because for whatever reason, LinkedIn really loves their newsletter feature and they will deliberately push it out. They love it audience. because they know they're the only one doing it. That's probably true. That's probably true. But the other thing that's so cool about it is it is like having a blog. It's 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 not just having articles, but it is literally housed on your on your LinkedIn profile. Um, it's like having a blog right there on LinkedIn and it doesn't go away that somebody could go to my profile, pull up newsletters, and they could read all my newsletters, all my past newsletters. Um, and I, but again, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't just have your LinkedIn newsletter. No, repurpose yeah. it. Yeah. Repurpose it everywhere. And why wouldn't you not want to do that anyway? I mean, there's so many opportunities for you to repurpose content that it doesn't make sense to not cross promote. So if you're on Facebook and you post a link and you put up a LinkedIn newsletter, take that link over to Facebook and share it with your audience there. Vice versa. You're doing something on Facebook, share it on LinkedIn. Um, so always cross promote. There's no reason to not do that because people... And here's the other thing. You're not just looking for clients that are on a particular platform. What about partnerships? What about speaking engagements? What about opportunities? What about, uh, you know, new, new things that might come your way that you were not even aware of? I mean, if you don't get out there in a big way, then you look small and you, those opportunities don't come to you. So if you want to attract bigger in your business, you've got to do bigger things. You've got to go bigger. Um, so those are, yeah, that's all the influence stuff that I teach people because, you know, opportunities will come to you if you are out there in multiple ways and you're not just playing in a box. Like if you are only on Facebook and, you know, face and that you, you've built a business worth millions of dollars on Facebook, but Facebook goes away or you get shut down, uh, you know, you're renting that platform basically. Now, I think most people are smart enough. They're, they've built an email list and things like that, but maybe not. I don't know. You but know what? I, I, I want your opinion anywhere else. I want your opinion on this. I've asked a couple of other people. I, I want to get as many people's opinions as possible with a, with the changes that Google has made, where instead of actually seeing search results, now we are seeing AI answers to questions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that websites and blogs are still going to be relevant seven years from now? I, I think everything's going to change um, with content, with websites and things like that. But a website is an answer. I mean, a website is a piece of your business. It's an asset to your business. It's kind of like your house. <laughs> Kind of like your home. I mean, if you think about it, when you're online, your website should be your sort of your home where people can really learn about you. Um, will they go away? Gosh, it's hard to say. I'm sure something will replace them, but I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I think everything, I think everything's going to shift with AI. I really do. But that doesn't mean, again, don't be scared by that. It means different things will, I don't know. I, I don't really love clicking the little things about the questions and all of that. I, I haven't really got into that yet. I want to still talk to a person. I still want to have authentic conversations. I still want to authentically see what you are all about. I think if you start taking the human element out of it, I don't think people are, I don't think it's going to go as deep yeah, as you, you they need think the, it will. You need the human I, do. I can't remember what was going on. I don't remember what website I was on or whatnot, but I had a question. There was something going on and I had a question. So I used the little question, you know, every, every website has a little question in the corner mm -hmm. to an, get your ans questions answered. And I kept getting the same answer. Mm -hmm. Did that help you? No. 
I need to know, blah, blah, blah. And then right. give me the same answer that they gave me before. Did that mm -hmm. help you? No. And then I tried to rephrase the question and it mm -hmm. just was this loop of unhelpfulness. Yes. So, yeah. And how much time did we waste? Oh, how much time is wasted? If I can just ask you, Hey, Candace, can you tell me this? And you yeah. go, sure. Anne. here you go. Instead of, uh, no, that wasn't the, no, that's not quite, you didn't quite understand the question. It's, yeah, it, it's not there yet. Now, will it be again? I don't know. Do we want to just be doing business and things with a bunch of robots? No. And then also where's the accountability factor as well? I don't know. We're, we're still human beings. We mm -hmm. still like human connection. We saw that through COVID. Yeah. A lot of people, they couldn't wait to get back out there in the world and, you know, see people again yeah, and yeah. hug people and, um, I, so if you look at all of that, I mean, I, I, I'm just going to say this. I really hope we don't take the human element out of our world. I think there's a business opportunity there <laughs> where that, you know, we're going to get to the point where there's so much automation that there mm -hmm. will be a but business model about adding the human connection back. And look, the more automation that there is, yes. And the more automation, I mean, talk to any entrepreneur, they get, they're so frustrated with tech. They're just frustrated with it. If it works, it's great. Oh gosh, there's nothing like it. But half the time it doesn't work, right? No. So what makes you think that AI is going to be better? And now you've got all these other platforms you have to learn and all this other stuff you have to learn. And and so there's this learning curve that for people to transition to. So yes, yeah, so everybody knows how to use chat GPT at this point, but well, not everybody, but, but they still don't know how to make videos with AI. They still don't know how to do graphics with AI. They still, there's, there, there's a learning curve for mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Well, and, um, and the capabilities aren't quite up to par yet. Right. You know, exactly. We, we still need to train them and teach them and, and learn and, it's going to be a while. So, you yeah. know, if you're, but if this is really fast, this has been a very fascinating conversation. Again, every seven years, things are, things change. Yeah. Things shift and we dramatically. don't really know. I mean, I, you know, I can sit here and guess, but I, I don't really know. Um, yeah. And honestly, I'll probably be, I will be retired by then. And I'm <laughs> doing <Yeah>. something. <laughs> <laughs> and it won't matter. I, we just want the, she, the young people of today need to know how to do it. So we need to make sure that they know how to do, know. deal with it. So but that you know what? I want to say, Candace, as you actually bring up a good point, because I have been around for a lot of years and I've done a lot of things and I built businesses offline. There are skill sets that you need to learn foundational skill sets that you need to learn so that you will never be out of business. So you will never be out of money. You will always know how to, I, I've been making money since I was seven years old, seven years old. I, I had a, my very first business. I sold craft classes in, in the basement to my neighbors. <laughs> Look at you. But I always sold something when I was growing up. I always sold something. They were seeds, you know, vegetable and flower seeds, or they were, there was Christmas cards. There were always things that I was looking for as an entrepreneur to make my own money. Babysat, you know, I did lots of things. And those are skills that I, I learned early on. So if a seven-year-old, I have seven-year-old triple grandkids. Oh, fun. And they have learned how to make money and become little entrepreneurs. My son has taught them. And so now they know how to go sell. And they know. So here's my point. If you know how to market and you know how to sell and you have a product and you can come up with a product, you've got a business. You've always got a job. You are recession proof. Mm -hmm. Learn those skill sets. Learn them. Mm -hmm. They will be the most valuable skill sets you can learn in business and then learn to understand money. All right. It's time to wrap up. Ann Cardin, this is your moment of gratitude. For whom or what are you most grateful? Oh my gosh. I, well, first of all, I am very grateful for my Lord and Savior. And I have to say that I'm nothing without him, but I am so grateful for my family. I adore them. They are so important to me in my life. And I could, I could give you a whole list of things I'm grateful for, but my family and my faith. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine 
lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Ann Carden, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 239. I've been your host, Candice Rodardi. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy. (laughs) 